third of six lectures this year. Uh, it's to be an annual lecture series. I would appreciate any ideas that you might have for future lectures. I would certainly try to satisfy your interests and your curiosity by matching up your ideas with people who've done some research in that area. Tonight we have Jim Oliver from Springfield who has for a number of years been interested in the history of uh, John Root and his relationship to Bishop Hill Colony. He's been doing some fresh research this year in preparation for this talk. I would like to introduce Jim. He's a little taller. to 
the other folks that were confined with him. And then this story was carried back to Jansen. Uh, he felt that the spirit may have fallen on Wester, and uh, to make him a good example, they brought him out again and preached to the congregation the following Sunday, which he was supposed to have done very well. But well, within a couple of days, Eric turned his back on Bishop Hill, left, to quote Eunomius, which I think is one of the better quotes in his book, um, spoke with great power, power and was fed. And after a couple of days, he turned his back on Bishop Hill, leaving the prophet to shave himself and select another husband for the last compulsive man. <laughs> preaching apparently had been good enough that uh, a few of the folks from Bishop Hill that were rather dissatisfied anyway decided to follow him to Galesburg where he set up a barber shop and uh, he would become their new prophet and religious leader. But according to Enonius again, by this time Lester was rather tired of preaching and uh, told them in good Swedish to go to Halsingland and forced them to do his hunger and not higher inspiration that had driven him to preach so well. Uh, one final note on Lester before we get to Ruth. You know, he just came across him again some years later. He doesn't say how many years. This time an advertisement for a store that Lester was operating. Apparently he'd gone into the mercantile business and uh, was operating a store down in Princeton and published a rather large ad uh, in the Princeton paper, which you know he has quoted in full, and I'm going to hit you with it because I think it's just great. Uh, Lester, in bold print across the top, begs to announce to the citizens of Princeton and its environs that he has sold out his old stock, paid his debts, and has now started with an entirely new stock superior to all others west of Chicago, though he still sells at the same prices as during the last seven years. That is, cheaper than anyone else. My stock consists of ready-made clothes, boots, shoes, hats, and caps, all kinds of articles belonging to a gentleman's wardrobe, Yankee notions, handbags, pocketbooks, knives, Colt's revolvers, pistols, double barrel guns, and all kinds of hunting equipment, groceries, cigars, chewing and smoking tobacco, candies, and etc. I have built an addition to my house, and there established tailoring, shoemaking, and gunsmithing shops. So that if you are looking for goods not kept in stock, I am ready with the greatest pleasure to take your orders, and my work will speak for itself. Now we come to the good part. I want to tell you the secret of how I am able to sell my clothing so much cheaper than anyone else. What I tell you is the truth, and nothing but the truth. I am in favor of free trade and seamen's rights, and that means that I take good care of what I do in regard to duties on my imported goods. You know I am a Swede. In Sweden there is a small city of about 20,000 inhabitants called Norkbein. The only manufacturer of the city is cloth, the best cloth in existence. You know that in this country we reckon by dollars, but in Sweden they reckon by rikstad, which it takes four to equal an American dollar. Now in Sweden I can buy as much for a rikstad as I can buy for a dollar in America. When I buy my cloth in Norfolk, I naturally get four yards for what one yard costs here. No wonder I can sell my clothes cheaper than anyone else and still make money. When my Swedish iron is shipped to this country, there is always enough room left in the ship for cloth I import. As for my shoes, let me state that I buy my sole leather in Rio de Janeiro after it has been tanned in Brazil and my calfskin in Paris. Through my connections with Mr. Rothschild, who always discounts my bills and supplies me with business advice, I assure you that I shall pull through these difficult financial times. If you have faith like a mustard seed, then come to me and buy your goods. Believe and you shall be saved. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, if we don't have the date on that, uh, that's something that I think could be found. Eumonius did not cite a date on it. Who is this Eumonius who quote? Uh, Augustus Eumonius was the author of, was the pioneer of North America, Swedish pioneer of North America. He was a uh, Swedish minister. Uh, was he a Congregationalist? Episcopalian. Episcopalian, right. Uh, who had settled in Pine Lake, Minnesota, uh, subsequently moved to Chicago and taken up a parish there. Uh, he visited Bishop Hill during his travels and wrote a two-volume book on his travels in North America. Um, the book was published right about the turn of the century translated at that time, and it's one of the, I think, the better references. Um, Eunonius was very biased, but he was biased against everybody, so I guess it all came out. What was the name of that book, Pioneers? Uh, what is it? Uh, I believe a Swedish pioneer in North America. The memories. I've got a site. Oh, just a second. Look it up and make sure. Minden. Minden. A pioneer of Northwest America, 1841 to 1858. The memoirs of Gustav Pinot. Okay, the third member of this merry little group that arrived in the fall of 48, which you probably think I was never going to get there, <laughs> was John Root. Uh, John Root gave the impression to the people of Bishop Hill and to a great many others as being uh, a very educated, uh, upper class person that was used to more of life's luxuries than normally one got in Bishop Hill at that particular time. Uh, to quote uh, the uh, state's attorney from down in Stark County, who wrote several letters to Governor French regarding the happenings in Bishop Hill from the period of 49 and 50. Um, Root was an educated Swede and a gentleman in his manners and intercourse in society, he was nurtured in luxury and indolence, who came among these people and sojourned. Now, there were two John Roots, apparently, because to others, notably Eunonius, <laughs> again, uh, he described Root as as sly and ungodly rascal as Jansen himself. Like I said, Eunonius didn't like anybody very much. <laughs> well, Root was here. Uh, and as most of you already know, um, Eric Jansen had lifted the ban on marriages in early 1848. And people were getting married at a rather rapid rate, talking about having performed 15, 20 marriages on a given Sunday. Uh, the, the <coughs> of 48. And when Root got here, this was still going on. As a matter of fact, Jansen was encouraging these marriages as illustrated by the Wester stories. Uh, <clears throat> Jansen did pick a girl and a quarter of her from Bishop Hill, uh, Charlotte Lavisa Jansen, who was the cousin of Eric Jansen and had been in his charge uh, since they had come from Chicago and founded the colony. Uh, as was the custom at that time, the oldest male member of the family was in charge of, of raising uh, the younger children. And when Eric's older brother, Jan, and Charlotta's sister, her older sister, uh, left the group of colonists and stayed in Chicago on the way through there. Eric J. 
Hansen became much like a father to Charlotte. <coughs> so courting marrying her was literally almost like marrying the boss's daughter in Bishop Hill. Um, known as for one, describes that as a motive. But uh, at any rate, they were married in November of 1848. But Ruth never really became interested in becoming a member of the colony. Charlotta stayed on, continued to work in the colony. Ruth was reported to have felt free to more or less come and go as he pleased. Uh, going off in the woods hunting, sometimes being gone for days at a time, and coming back and taking advantage of the hospitality of the colony, more or less whenever he felt like it. Uh, there was supposed to be, although I've never seen it in writing, cited a number of sources, a prenuptial agreement that was insisted upon by Jansen and Lotta when she and Ruth were married. And that was that if Ruth ever decided that he wanted to leave the colony, that Charlotte would be entitled to a divorce and would be able to remain in the colony. Uh, that was the cause of a large part of their labor dispute. Now, according to Silver Erdahl, who wrote an article in the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society in 1925, about a month after uh, Ruth and Charlotte were married, Ruth decided that it was time that he left the colony. Uh, the dates and time frames get a little fuzzy about this point uh, because that would have put it approximately December, probably no later than the end of December of 48. However, if we indulge in a little grand old American practice of counting up the months on your fingers, fingers since John Jr. was born on uh, October the 25th, 1849, that means probably John was still around, at least through the end of January, and probably a little bit longer. Uh, but shortly thereafter, we're pretty sure that he did leave sometime between the end of January and early July, and stayed gone for most of that period of time. Um, he came back to the colony after October. Now this is, was kind of important because one of the defenses that was later used was that he was trying to avoid the cholera epidemic. Now as most of you already know too, the cholera ep epidemic hit Bishopville in July of 49. And by mid-September, it had largely subsided. <coughs> While it hit real hard, it didn't last really all of that long. Uh, but Ruth was apparently a little afraid of it still, because starting in October was when he started trying to persuade Lana to leave with him. solid day on him. Uh, Ruth did come back to Bishop Hill, uh, asked Lotta to go with him, and when she refused, he threatened to take their child and leave anyway. Well, at that, Lotta agreed to leave with him, and Ruth was down here and allegedly been attempting to raise a mob up around the northern end of the county for several days prior to this, finally succeeded in persuading one Daniel Stanley to come down with him. Came down that afternoon and talked to Lotta, and this was during the dinner hour, and persuaded her to leave with him. 
But uh, they were seen leaving, and I don't think they made a great secret of it. And an alarm was given, and very shortly, a group of horsemen from the colony caught them within approximately two miles of the village. Asked a lot if she wanted to come back. She said yes. And in the melee, Rouge, who had a pistol, is said to have dropped it. It was picked up by one of the Swedes, and Lotta was brought back to the colony. Uh, John got a little upset about that, understandably, I think. So the following day, he went over to Cambridge and swore out a warrant for the arrest of Eric Jansen, charging him with riot. Um, and as Mrs. Root was subpoenaed as a witness to the acts that took place, she had to go to Cambridge in order to testify. Well, now there's some that say that John Root had a secret agreement with one of the principals in Cambridge because when she got there, Root again gained possession of his wife. She was taken to the north end of the county by a man named Wesley Hannah, where she was <clears throat> again picked up by John Root, and according to whose account you believe, she uh, went with him to Rock Island and then to Chicago, or straight on to Chicago. Within a very few days after that, they had some contact with Jan Chance, the brother of Eric, and Lotta's older sister in Chicago. Uh, Jan is the one that's usually credited with getting word back to Bishopville as to the whereabouts of Mrs. Root. Now, by the way, on the charge of riot, uh, Root did not show up at the examination of the charges, and therefore the charges were dropped. So he had his wife, so he had you know, what he was after to begin with. Um, <coughs> but anyway, when they got to Chicago, word came back to Chance. Oh yes, at the, uh, at the examination too, after Ruth didn't show up, the charges were dropped. W.W. Uh, Drummond again said in a letter to the governor that one of the more celebrated lawyers in the county had told Jansen that they were free to take Mrs. Ruth back wherever they could find her. So, apparently he took that advice uh, when they received notification of where they were, the group uh, led by Jonas Olson uh, left Bishop Hill. This must have quite an operation. Uh, stationed fresh horses every few miles between Chicago and Bishop Hill. Picked a time when Ruth was out of the house. Uh, picked Lana up, brought her and the baby back to Bishop Hill nonstop. Well, Ruth found it out pretty quick, as you might guess. And this time he went to a court in Chicago, swore out a warrant uh, for Jansen again, this time for kidnapping. Came back to uh, Henry County, up to Cambridge, um, obtained another search warrant to search for his wife, and turned them over to a constable, which I assuming was Matthew Potter, who was the sheriff of Henry County at that point. And he raised a posse and they came to Bishop Hill and started looking for Jansen and Mrs. Root. Well, Jansen had been warned and they did some hiding out, allegedly in a cave near here. Came down and tried to serve the warrant, didn't find anybody. So apparently some threats were made and Folks here in the colony that they did find were told that they had until the next morning to produce Mrs. Root. Well, the posse came back the next morning, still no Mrs. Root. So at this point, I guess the sheriff figured he had better things to do. Uh, the posse was disbanded and Root left. Now, according to uh, Harmon G. Reynolds, who was the state's attorney, 
here in Henry County at that time. Uh, there were a few that got a little disorderly during that, that last trip of the posse. Apparently, some boards were torn off of the, uh, the colony church, a few bricks dislodged here and there. But the Americans in the posse apparently were instrumental in subduing their own and got away without an awful lot of damage. Well, anyway, John Jansen <coughs> knew which way the wind was blowing and felt that this was probably going to continue if they didn't do something. So first thing is they sent Jonas Olson off of the uh, head of the party to go to California and see if they could strike gold, which seemed like a good thing to do. The colony was in pretty deep financial trouble at that point. And if they had struck gold, it would have been the end probably of the colony's financial troubles. Uh, and in the meantime, Jansen, along with Mrs. Root and Jansen's new wife, uh, and several others left uh, Henry County and took a trip to St. Louis. And down there they engaged a lawyer by the name of Britton Hill, who was a prominent St. Louis attorney at that time. And on April 8, 1850, Hill wrote a letter to Augustus French, who was governor of Illinois. We had a lot of correspondence going to the two governors involved in Illinois during this time. But in this letter, Hill asked for the governor, save these unfortunate colonists from harm by exercising that authority which the law and constitution have placed in your hands for the execution of the laws and the suppression of insurrection. So we've gone from mere riot and posse coming out to insurrection by now. Uh, included with this letter, though, also was an affidavit by Mrs. Root, which stated that she had voluntarily left her husband while they were in Chicago, and that she would not now return to him because of his, quote, violence, abuse, and ill treatment, and that she feared for her life if she were to return to him. Now, during the time that Jansen and this party were in St. Louis, uh, somehow a rumor started up here that John Jr., um, his child, had died. Uh, this rumor was very obviously false, but it did add a little fuel to the fire, and Ruth may have believed it for a while. Uh, and he raised another armed mob from around the vicinity of Green River, and made one more try to raid on the colony. But this time, E.U. Norberg, who had been a colonist, but also been a um, member of Eunonia's settlement at Pine Lake, uh, got wind of it. He was also a former constable in Sweden, I believe. And he raised his own policy <coughs> down here in defense of the colony. Uh, the two mobs men met right outside the village, and they did agree to a talk. Norberg apparently convinced Root's mob that um, Jansen had not really kidnapped Root's wife, and that they would be doing an injustice if they did any damage to the colony. Mrs. Root was not here. It wasn't going to do him good an awful lot of him to look. So the mob disbanded. According to some sources, they were getting kind of mad at Root this time. It was about the third one he'd come up with. And none of them really had much fun yet. They hadn't got to do any burning or pillaging. Fun. But anyway, uh, then in May, this happened between about April 8th and the beginning of May. And on May 11th, Jansen came back to the colony. Um, most of you know there, the colony was having quite a lot of financial trouble at that point due to you know, some swindles, notably Dr. Foster. And possibly Jansen was not the greatest businessman. 
Uh, but they were having some trouble meeting their bills. And there were some suits that had been filed against the colony in Cambridge. And that required Jansen's presence. Came back to Bishop Hill on the 11th. And that was a Saturday. And on Sunday, May 12th, he preached a sermon taken from 2 Timothy, uh, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, in which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, not only to me, but unto all those who also, also their love is appearing. Uh, a lot of folks have said that that meant that Eric had a premonition, and he may well have. Um, the following day, when he was leaving for Cambridge, a uh, person that was driving the wagon up there for him was a Mr. Mescal. And when Eric came out of his house, he said, well, Mr. Mescal, will you stop the bullet for me today? And uh, Mescal said, yes. Uh, but you just can't rely on some people's promises. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, on the 13th, um, at the noon recess, uh, the council we have are roughly as follows. They don't vary too much. Uh, about 1 o'clock, John Root appeared at the window. Jansen was inside talking to a lawyer, uh, Samuel Brainerd. <clears throat> and Root asked Jansen if he would return his wife and son. Uh, now, some sources say this was said to Swedish and others not, but Jansen is supposed to have replied to the effect that a sow would make a more fit companion for Root than a woman. Uh, very diplomatic. Uh, and Root then went to the door of the courtroom called Eric Jansen by name, produced a pistol, and when Jansen turned to look, fired a shot which struck Jansen in the chest. Root then produced a second pistol and fired again, tearing a hole in the prophet's clothing, but the first one had accomplished its purpose, and within a few minutes, Jansen was dead. Uh, at that point, Root surrendered without resistance and according to an account in the Knoxville Journal of May 15th, he stated that he had had nothing more to live for because he had accomplished all that he had desired. <coughs> he hadn't got his wife back, but he had killed Eric Jansen. Uh, Jansen's body was brought back to Bishop Hill by Nils Hedden and Jacob Jacobson and lay in state here in Bishop Hill. We won't go into the the funeral ritual at this time, but we will go into what happened to Root. Uh, on May 14th, on the following day, John Root presented a brief to the court requesting time to prepare a defense and secure counsel. On May 18th, he was indicted for murder and held in the jail of Toulon since the authorities in Cambridge feared further mob violence if he were to be held here. Now, Mr. Drummond, W. W. Drummond, who was the state's attorney down in uh, Tulane at that time, was just about as afraid of mob violence down there. Uh, as a matter of fact, he wrote Governor French on May 16th. Well, Governor, Mr. Drummond wrote, let me say to you that the murdering of Jansen is only a beginning to the deeds of desperation that are to follow in Henry County and even our county, Stark County is threatened because of Root being in our jail. We are to be killed, our courthouse and jail to be burned, and Root to be rescued at all hazards. Uh, and he wrote again on May 25th and said, quote, to me there is no longer any doubt in relation to a want of legal power in Henry County to suppress that band of marauders, Root supporters. The sheriff, Matthew B. Potter, is a good man and will do all he can to preserve the case against Root <clears throat> inviolate 
but proof certain beyond doubt shows most conclusively that the men in whom he confides are traitors. And here I will remark that intimations are out that the state's attorney is to enter a nola prosequi, legal term, in some certain cases and events, for instance, through and then prosecuted for the Bishop of Cone. Which report, however, I believe to be false, yet it shows the desperate state of feeling as it exists in the community. We are told that the Methodist Church is advocating Root's course as a murderer because Jansen had a belief peculiar to himself and his people. Drummond didn't indicate what his proof was that the case against Root was being sabotaged. But this happened in the May term of the circuit court in 1850. Uh, a delay was granted in the September term, and another again in the May term at the Henry County Circuit Court. And in the September term in 1851, a change of venue was granted down to Knox County because of the fact that Nobody thought that John Root was going to get a fair trial anywhere in Henry County. Uh, after the change of venue, the trial was delayed again. They were granted another um, continuance in the May term of the court in Knox County. And the, trial, the case finally came to trial in the September term of the 10th Judicial Circuit in Knox County. In 1852. Now, most all of this time, Root had been sitting down in jail down in Tula. Um, and one source at least says that he was transferred to the jail in Rock Island after the change of venue, but he had spent the entire time incarcerated. Uh, 28 months altogether, from the time of the shooting until the time he was tried. Uh, the trial was hopefully very interesting. Some of you know who we were talking to her. It was up here last weekend giving one last shot at trying to find that case file. Um, and it is missing. At least we haven't been able to find it yet. Uh, so essentially, all we know is from the newspaper accounts and from the judge's dockets that sort of thing. The newspaper accounts say that there were more people in Knoxville than they had ever seen at the court days watching that <coughs> trial. You know, we went, they went through and choosing a panel of jurors for this trial. Went through more than 96 people. Went through nine panels of jurors before they could come up with a jury of 12 men. Uh, when the case did go to trial after the jury selection, took over three days, lasted until late into Saturday night, which is quite a long time for even a murder trial. And when the whole thing was said and done, the jury came back with a verdict of, now remember he was indicted and tried for murder. The jury came back with a verdict of guilty of manslaughter and recommended a sentence of two years confinement in the state penitentiary at all. Uh, which kind of leads one to believe that Root had been successful in convincing a number of people that Jansen had stolen his wife and that uh, Many other men would have acted as he did. And there was no doubt that he had shot Eric Jansen. And that was <laughs> no, no doubt in anybody's mind. But the fact that they would reduce the charge to manslaughter was quite interesting. <clears throat> One of the little items that ran in the uh, Knoxville Journal the day, well, the week after the trial was over, uh, contained the part about there being more people in town for this term of the court than there had ever been. 
Uh, but the editor also wrote that I am sorry that we cannot give a detailed account of the trial at this time. Um, if you lived this long, I'd have strangled it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the next, the next paper gave a, uh, another little blurb in there that said that they apologized for the continuing illness of the editor, so maybe that was the reason for it. Uh, we think the reason why he got by with that in his defense was largely that Jansen had stolen his wife. Now, there were even rumors circulating much after the trial, even after Ruth was out of jail, so much that Charlotta uh, felt it necessary to do another affidavit many years later. Swearing that she had never had any kind of an improper relationship with Eric Jansen. And I can kind of see how that rumor got started. If you did not know that they were in a family relationship, and somebody accuses you of stealing his wife, most folks don't steal somebody's wife because she's a good cook. <laughs> so, so. <coughs> But it's still a little speculated. Now we'll see, you know, I don't know, maybe some good questions can come up. Uh, one of the questions that kept coming up was why was Jansen so adamant about not letting Charlotte leave? I mean, he knew what was happening. He thought there was a chance he was going to get shot, had to go off or get killed, um, had to go off and spend time in hiding. Why was he so adamant about keeping Charlotte? Uh, one possibility is that Charlotte just, if she had defected, may just have been the straw that broke the camera. Uh, the colony had had a number of other defections, but when one of his own family members went, that would be a severe black eye. Uh, and in Jansen's situation at the time, there was a man that had extreme financial troubles that were getting worse. They had had a number of defections, and just about the time he thought he got rid of John Ruth the first time, early in 1849, when he left, they had the cholera outbreak, lost about a third of the members of the colony. And when, including Jansen's own wife, by the way, and then just about the time that the cholera ep epidemic is over with, here comes Ruth again, and the whole, whole thing starts all over. Uh, if I was Jansen, I think I would have been a little tired of it, too. But I believe it was because that in view of Jansen's preaching that the colony's troubles were being brought on by unbelievers to let a member of his own family be seduced away by an unbeliever would have been a very another further, very serious blow to the colony. I think that's probably one of the reasons why he was. Uh, John Ruse, I've said, was tried the September term of the Knox Courthouse in 1852. He was convicted on Saturday, September 16th, uh, sent to the state penitentiary in Alton, where his sentence stated that he was to spend his first five days uh, in solitary confinement. And then in late February of 1854, when he had served just about a year and a half of his two-year sentence, uh, the uh, governor's wife, uh, his daughters and a delegation of congressmen visited the prison at all where they talked to John Reed. Now, John Reed's pardon was already in the works at this point. We think the main 
motivating force behind that was a man by the name of Benjamin Dan Walsh, who Duke had apparently befriended when he was here in Bishop Hill. Walsh owned a farm about three miles north of here. Uh, Walsh did not like the colony very much, did not like Eric Jansen very much. Uh, for a number of reasons, the ones that he stated were that uh, the colony was very faithless in their contracts. In other words, they didn't pay their bills very well. Uh, another was that they had dammed up the Edwards River and caused, in his mind, the area to become malaria. Uh, and he said it was becoming malarial. He may have had a point. Benjamin Dan Walsh moved to Rock Island in 1850, started a lumber business, and became quite successful. Uh, Walsh was a graduate of Trinity College in England. He was an Englishman that had migrated to this area in the 1830s. Uh, his degree was in divinity, and he had turned down his fellowship, stating that he was not happy with the hypocrisy in the Anglican Church, therefore he wanted no part of it, left, came to America. Um, so you can see why he might be a little upset when a religious community <laughs> moves in next door to him. Uh, one that he thought was probably indulged in as much hypocrisy as the Anglican Church did, given the fact that they were, as he said, faithless in their contracts. At any rate, Benjamin Dan Walsh later was appointed the first <coughs> state entomologist in the state of Illinois in the early 1860s. And when he lived in Rock Island. And the petitions that were received by Governor Madison in support of Ruth's pardon contained more than 600 names, almost all of them, from the Rock Island area. And they included Walsh's name. They included several of his friends, including some bank presidents, uh, the Rock Island County Sheriff, um, and various other prominent business people at that time. Uh, when the governor's wife and daughter went down and made the visit, the pardon was in the works. But there was a condition attached on it. Governor Madison had decided that he would pardon Root on the condition that he leave the state and not return. Uh, when Root heard this from the governor's family, he is said to have cried and told him that he did not expect to live very long anyway. He wasn't sure if he could even live out the remaining seven months of his sentence, and that he wanted to be allowed to die in Illinois among his friends. So that uh, restriction was removed. And on March 6th of 1854, Root walked out of the old prison a free man. Uh, the Rock Island Republican of March 15, 1850, <coughs> says, and I quote, John Root, who shot Jansen in the courthouse at Cambridge and was sentenced to the penitentiary for two years, has been pardoned by the governor and was in town last week. His sentence would have expired on the 8th of October. But apparently, he passed through Rock Island on his way to Chicago, where Eunonius picks him up again. Um, Eunonius says that Root was never known to work while he was in Chicago. But there was a series of robberies. <laughs> uh, just the only connection is by implication. Uh, Root lived in Chicago for, we think, maybe two years because I knew he was fine. You know, one thing about Rudy was extremely discourteous. He did not live until past the fire in 1871, so he even found his death records. 
uh, they have been <coughs> disappeared also. Uh, but we think he probably died somewhere in the neighborhood of 18, late 1855 or 1856. One account has it that he was uh, severely injured in a barroom brawl by another man jumping on his chest and crushing his ribs. Uh, and Eunonius again says that he died sometimes blaspheming God and, uh, and at other times begging for his forgiveness. Well, I guess if you blaspheme him enough, you better ask for a little forgiveness. But uh, he was accompanied to his grave by Eric Chauvin, who was a Methodist minister at the time in Chicago, and who said that he thinks that every Swede in Chicago uh, attended that funeral and followed him to the cemetery. Uh, the man that was that popular, it's hard to understand why you can't find out more about him good or bad. Um, but then on the other hand, maybe a lot of them just wanted to make sure that he was dead, too. <laughs> so, that's about all I have. Are there any questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah, this may seem disconnected, but I thought of it before you talked about the Roberts. At one point, I think you said that Root left Bishop Hill with his wife, they went to Rock Island, and then went to Chicago. Uh, what was the source of his funds? We do not know. There was a rumor that floated around here in Bishop Hill for a while during one of his absences prior to that. Uh, he was hired by, depending on what source you want to believe, either a Norwegian or a Jewish peddler. It seemed a little unlikely that it would have been Norwegian. Um, and he was supposed to have worked for him um, as an interpreter and guide. Uh, we uh, would like to say this to all of um, uh, Just like you say, there's no proof of these fire room brawls and this. Now, my wife and I, I think, have been like you have, and you've been to more. <laughs> We should get together sometime. We've been some places you've been, and you've been more places than we have in that regard. But uh, we found his name, the name John Root, in Chicago at the Historical Society after he left Alton, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a carpenter. And that's entirely possible because that relative of his that stayed in Chicago built the altar for the First Methodist Church in Chicago. So maybe he did get into the carpentry business. We haven't been able to uh, uh, substantiate that part of it. To get back to the beginning, Mary Louise here and I were in Sweden in October, and uh, we were invited to the home of the relatives of the gents and the brother here who stayed there. And they say that Eric, uh, Eric, let's see, now, John Good's father was a lawyer in uh, Nora Parish near Tarnsway. Now, we were scheduled and uh, we were running a little late, so we didn't go back there to verify that, but so help us, we're going back. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll look into it further. There was one thing I was, I was kind of hoping you would bring up, too, that we didn't go into. Uh, there was, there is a theory, excellent, that Okay, we haven't been able to trace John's roots back to Sweden at this point. We're not really sure who he was. Um, there was a theory advanced last year in uh, the Swedish American genealogist by an author named Oscar from Sweden uh, that a Carl Johann Rutermark and John Root were one and the same. Uh, Ruther Mark was a defrocked priest who went to a hiring hall in Stockholm, um, got a job as an able-bodied seaman on a ship coming to New York, got to New York and jumped ship, and again pops out of sight. Uh, the time frame 
would fit. Uh, and there are too many coincidences there. John Root was described as an educated Swede, cultivated in his man's. Um, certainly the education of a Rutermark would have provided this. Uh, one thing that we have not been able to resolve is that uh, Rutermark's age was 40 years old when he jumped ship in uh, New York. Uh, he was born in 1807, which would have made him 41 by the time he got here and married uh, Charlotte. Uh, John Root appears on the 1850 census in Stark County, in the uh, Stark County Jail, where he lists his age as 26, <laughs> and his occupation as a student. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to figure that one out yet. <laughs> I, uh, let's see, in that, in that Rudemark thing, that's some more of this innuendo and rumor. <laughs> uh, well, that, that article has... Some of us may be able to pass for 15 years younger than yeah. we really are, but... <laughs> <laughs> the thing of it is, I've written the page on the... Uppsala Tiefening printed the article written by uh, Borea Gustberg of Falun. Now, when we were in Sweden, Mary Louise and I visited with Falun at the hotel. And uh, he had already written the story and published it in the Uppsala Tiefening. And also, he was a friend of Nils William Olson, who writes The Swedish Genealogist, and Nils William Olson has published it. Now, we went through, I don't know how many tapes from the Mormons or in Salt Lake City anyway, and we believe that we have the ship's record, that he arrived in New Orleans on November 15, 1847. Now then, uh, they are refuting that date, and I uh, did promise you that I'd bring you the ship's record. We have a copy of it. But not since be. it's been refuted, we're going to prove it before, <laughs> before it's published. But it ties in very be. closely with his arrival here in Bishopville. There's only three years difference. Now, on the ship's record, it showed him to be 20, as you said. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1850, he, was, he listed his age as 26. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I would think that a ship's manifest wouldn't be too awfully difficult to either prove or disprove one way or the other. Incidentally, uh, Edna Warner told me that he died on May 13, 1856. Now, where she got it, I don't know. I don't, I don't recall asking her. Six years to the day after the murder. And uh, we, uh, we visited the jail in Knoxville where he was in hell. And the cell wasn't long enough so he could stretch out and this toilet was a hole in the floor, so. <laughs> so that jail was still there. <laughs> and I, I, I remember the name of the first I can remember quite a ways back, having been back there quite a ways. <laughs> but there's a Dorothea Dix who I had a, a campaign against sanitary conditions in jails. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote an article on the Alton Jail and they were carrying him out of there eight and 10 a day, dying from consumption because of the damp conditions. Well, so that's, that was that way, right? <laughs> that's what they, they said his illness was. And Benjamin Walsh uh, said that. I'm glad you mentioned about the people of Rock Island who asked that he be pardoned. And of course, it was discussed last week, but we all know that uh, what Walsh said, that here Jansen claimed he was a kind of an incarnation of Jesus Christ, and he claimed that unbelievers versus the Jansenists were in the same relationship as the Jews were against the uh, heathens in, in Bible times. And at that time, too, because of that connection, they believed that it was not, not a sin to lie. And uh, I know uh, Benjamin Walsh uh, pointed out, too, that uh, he uh, had known many times when they would, people would go to court and uh, uh, say what, what pleased them. 
But uh, Benjamin Walsh also said that he had seen page after page of writing by John Riff. And he said it was absolutely falseless, fault, fault, not falseless, <coughs> faultless in grammar and spelling. So he was, and uh, Marilyn Eastrom, one of the old genealogists, felt there was a possibility that he was an Englishman, so highly educated that he spoke Swedish very well. Now that might be far-fetched, but <laughs> anyway, you know, we, we wrote well, I, I thought uh, Walt was talking about letters in English, mm -hmm. which uh, would lend something to the fact that Root was you know, supposed to be a very educated, cultivated person, which would go along with the education that he would have received if he was Ritter Mark. Uh, if he was not, we hadn't figured out where he was educated. Oh, okay. well, Walsh brought out too, he probably noticed it, that uh, he used the example of, uh, let's say, a, a Catholic bishop taking the wife and child of one of the parishioners and uh, refusing for the man to see his wife or uh, his child and ripped uh, they would be hidden never to uh, be seen again so that he felt that possibly there was some justification for but then I think finally uh, uh, Mary Louise here got a letter from I hope she won't mind my mentioning it on December 14, 1860, <laughs> from Emmeline Arnquist. And uh, she, had, she had written, we were talking. Well, we were all concerned. We didn't condone what happened. Uh, it wasn't the way to solve things, it's true. Uh, so, uh, and our mother was very, very ashamed of the whole situation, such that she never told us anything. And neither did my grandpa, with whom I lived for a while. Uh, but she wrote that John Sr. and Jr., according to her research, were above average in every way. John Jr. rose above the smears on the family name. Uh, <coughs> Because he was morally and intellectually secure. She says, and it's in the letter in her handwriting, that nine tenths of the people with whom she talked when she was doing her research felt that the action that Ruth took was justified. I'm not saying it's justified, I'm not proud of it, I don't mean that at all. But uh, this, these are some of the other opinions that they had too. And I wish, if anyone knows where to get in touch with some of the children family, we've gone to the cemetery records in Chicago, <coughs> and uh, we believe that he was buried in the Lincoln Park Cemetery, but the bodies were exhumed and moved, and we never found them since. Well, I read somewhere. I, I would have to go back and look this up. But I do recall reading that the children was supposed to have become the minister at Bishop Hill Methodist Church from 1870 to 73. Uh, Jack, where he went from there? What? Uh, about two years ago, or three years ago, I talked to children's grandson in California. He was, he was up in years. He, but he just come back from the uh, camping trip in the valley, he said. And he might be, he was born, he was born in the uh, before 1900, so he's, he's up in years. He was a farmer. Um, let's see. Yeah. His mother was a farmer too. She went to Knox College. Um, and she was Shogun's daughter. Um, she, she was an author. Um, there was another son of a um, farm and son. And, and I think t looking through the old um, Galva. Or, um, Galvaland magazines, he, uh, there's an, a, a letter from him there. He lived in the east, around Baltimore in that area. Um, I don't, uh, I probably got it home, this guy's address and, and phone number <laughs> if he's still alive, but he'd be up in years. Well, uh, Shoker himself, as I recall, I think I remember reading, he 
died in 1906. I'm not sure where. Napa, Napa California was kind of home. Okay. Of that. I forget whether it was the farmers or children. Uh, last summer at the Henry County Museum, we had the great granddaughter of the children that came in just for an afternoon. She was looking up his, uh, some history of our family. And she lives in Minneapolis, and she gave me her address, so I do have that that I could give to you. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, I appreciate it. She's a younger woman. I think <coughs> she would probably be in her early 30s. And, uh, she, and she didn't seem to have too much material family history, but she wanted to know more about the family. But that was the name. And she said she thought that they had organized the church her grandfather had where they had organized a speech not this church here in uh, Bishop Hill. But I do, I'll give you that address. I have uh, two questions about Charlotte. Uh, is she married at Bishop Hill? And did she marry again? Uh, first question, no, she did not marry again. Uh, she lived out her life on a farm near here. And I believe she is buried in the cemetery. Is she not around? You know? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we have the uh, location of the plot. Mm -hmm. She's buried on the, uh, maybe you've noticed out there, there's a, there used to be a fence around the roof lot, a heavy cast iron fence. And some of this village re required that the fences be moved, and my uncle moved it to some other thing that wish he hadn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, Ryan Spence saved us the gate and some other parts of the fence, and it's been anchored up there on the, on the grave as uh, marking the grave site. And she's married, buried on, on the lot there. Uh, this is a uh, poor named Nordstrom. Yeah, well, the village clerk, didn't she? Where are the days, the Finn Cemetery of Regarding the marriage, Mr. Colonel, she was uh, I have seen a paper, this little slip of paper, where Charlotte has a sign with an X uh, that she was wanted to be free to stay in Bishop Hill if her husband should ever want to leave. Where was this? Uh, it it uh, was among the papers that Leonard Michael came in 1971. Yes. Just a little slip of paper, but John Luke had not signed it. So she has signed it with an X, which means that she could not write herself. And then you wonder if she could read, and if she even... Uh, well, she, she was, was from, from what I recall, she was not literate in English. No. No, this is written in Swedish. And, and she, she couldn't even write her name, just an X. Uh, she did, though, later sign her name. Granted, it does not, it's not in the greatest flowing hand no. here, so, but she did sign the uh, affidavit uh, from Britain Hill and said this. I see. So uh, this act could have been written by anybody else, really? Uh, we don't know. Mm -hmm. If it's witnessed, uh, I would like to see that. No, it is it was just no, it's, a no, it's possible uh, folks were learning English from my understanding, almost from day one. Sure, it <laughs> may be that she learned. But at least, uh, I think he didn't sign it, then he yeah. was right, and also he was, he didn't agree with that statement. Well, maybe that was one of those great mutual agreements that only one of them agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I was wondering uh, what his sentence would have been if he had uh, been convicted for murder. Do you know that? Uh, no, I do not know. I think the sentencing was largely up to the jury at that time. They did de determine. But don't you think it would have been death if he had been convicted of first degree murder? I, I don't know. I, the death penalty was in use at that time. Usually they hung him. That's what I thought. Um, but not very many. And usually for something like murder, it would have been a possibility, I guess, but I think it would have been up to the jury. Then I was wondering why he served uh, for so long when the sentence was two years. Because he had already served two years when he was sentenced. So it's actually four years that he's... That was one of the considerations, I believe, that was taken into account when the jury passed the sentence, was that he had 
served these 28 months previously mm -hmm. and possibly they knocked some time off and that the two-year sentence was less than you would have gotten otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would like to say something also about the uh, passenger records. So, um, the, the fact that uh, there's a name below John Wood's name in the passenger record, that looks like Western or Westin possibly. And this uh, Wester is listed as being born in Sweden, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. it, it meant credibility to the fact that those two came to the United States together. Yeah, it doesn't say that John Ruth was born in Sweden, but it says that this Wester was born in Sweden. Yeah, yeah. Wester apparently was well known to the Anonis. Yeah. So, yeah, he talks a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, going into. Do we know where Wester was from in Sweden? Uh, yes, I'd have to look it up. Um, we'll the idea, was... though, according to, again, you know, he's, he, he tells us that he was baptized Westerberg in Sweden. And the way the story is related that he was employed by a banking institution and uh, was sent to uh, another town on a on an assignment to buy the type of paper that the bank That's used right. to print yeah. notes right. mm -hmm. and uh, just forgot to stop and buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Took ended, the up money, in, yeah. ended up here in America a few weeks later. It didn't say in the past it was no uh, first name But it said he was 20 years old, and it also said that John Ruth was 20 years old. Jim, I, I don't want people to leave here thinking that uh, we're 100% root on our, tri our trip to uh, Sweden in October. I told Mrs. Peterson, Helen, that we spent so much time on John Ruth, let's find the Peterson, so let's find your descendants. So, we, so we were treated very, very kindly by some of the people who were here on the program, their musical program and dancing. Uh, we didn't want to go to the museum, but we simply couldn't turn it down. So we wanted to get on the road. But we went into the museum, and there was the picture that appears in Faces of Utopia of the two old ladies that had written that. And down, and down below were their names, and Helen pulled out her genealogy, and. Uh, uh, they are her great grandmother and her great great grandmother and her great grandfather from Bulls. And and Wiesickson has the same picture in his book. And we never knew that before. We had to go to Sweden to find that out. But anyway, that so really there's and they were so Jansen that uh, the great great grandmother had to get a letter from her husband that she could leave the colony because he refused to leave Sweden because he refused to go. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that kind of balances the scale as far as, far as our family is concerned. You know, Benjamin Van Walsh uh, presents probably one of the more balanced views too. Uh, he said essentially they were both wrong. Truth and Jansen both. And I think there's a certain degree of truth in that. I suspect that what we were looking at over the hundred and thirty years ago was just a monumental clash of egos between Jansen and also I believe Ruth probably had a pretty good one too. Yes. I've understood that because uh, an individual made a mark did not necessarily mean that they did not read. That's possible. Hmm. <coughs> Especially among this group of people. Jim? Yeah. Sonberg did quite a bit of research on literacy by checking who signed at different times, right, Roy? Yeah. Charters and things. And Chell Soderberg from the Census database feels that 
96% of the Swedes could read by the time the Bishop Hill people were coming. And about two-thirds of them can't sign their name. And the reason he thinks for this is because the priests are examining them on reading the Bible, and they're forced to learn to read. They're not forced to learn to write. Okay, well, Charlotte did also sign her uh, divorce petition, too. So we have at least two of her signatures. Anything else? Well, I have a question that's related to this. Uh, I hadn't thought till today when I was thinking about this John Hood and Harry Chance and two between them, uh, that as far as I've been able to find out, that, that Carlotta's leaving was the only instance that I know about where the authorities in the county tried to go out and bring someone back. Am I right in that? As far as I know, yes. I know there were a lot of people who left Bishopville and went various places. It was a, it was a real problem for yeah. Jansen. It was the desertion rate, if you will. And I, I suspect, like I said, that it was due to the family relationship and the symbolism of having the one that was in the place of his daughter walk out would have been a strong blow to his ability to lead the count. Yes? Uh, attitudes toward marriage and divorce then were a lot different. Divorce was almost unthinkable. And for a man to have someone else persuade his wife to go off with him or return, it was a blow not only to his feelings and to his manhood, and he, could hope, he might think there was only one reason for it. And uh, I could see his, uh, it was, such was not unknown. In Texas, they call it Texas law. <laughs> well, now I, I'm uh, sure that that, that, that is, is true to a certain degree. It was uh, you know, a matter of, of roots we go against Jansen. But again, the reason that it was easy to convince uh, folks that were outside that were not aware that Jansen was, or that Charlotta was literally in the place of a daughter to uh, Jansen, uh, that would give rise to some speculation that I think is probably false. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask, could his attitude be if Jansen knew she didn't want to go? Others he knew wanted to go. Yeah. We don't know for sure how she we don't. Thought. We don't know for sure, but I think the evidence points to that she wanted to stay. Um, we have a young girl with a young child who's, uh, I think, well, she was, I believe, largely illiterate in English and probably felt much more secure. And I think that her religious beliefs honestly dictated to her that she should stay here in the county. Did John Jr. ever address anything about this? I mean, he was a very well educated man. Did he ever write anything about it? Well, no, I mean, Not an awful lot that I know of. Um, the, oh, he is mentioned, and I think possibly one of the authors of the uh, 50th anniversary reunion of the old settlers. Mm -hmm. Association, but uh, I know of no other publications on this subject that he ever did. No, that's true. We, we've never found anything. And he was a liar and couldn't condone even manslaughter, so maybe he never spoke to my brother or me or Mary Louise here about it. We 
we wish we had questioned it, but we didn't tell us that. Well, of course, the only thing that he would have had was what was passed down to him. <laughs> You know, given his age at the time. Yeah. yeah, I would like to say something on why I think uh, Lofta uh, wanted to stay in the colony, and that is uh, that um, the letters that I have read and translated uh, are written by the colonists home to Sweden at that, in that uh, time period. Uh, they all indicated that if if the colonists left the colony, and if they deserted <coughs> the Jansenist state, they, their souls would be lost forever. Eternally damned. Yes, and so they were actually afraid of leaving, especially the women were afraid of leaving. Uh, he had a, a real spell on them. That well, it also probably made it harder for Jansen to give up his cousin. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot more in those letters that I translated that did not get translated because the religion, it was just too much religion in them. So the editors just cut it out. But uh, since I read all of it, I had a feeling that the women especially were afraid even to call me because they thought they would be gay if they did. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I do enjoy the scene. John Root was the was Paul was the Paul Bear or Gary Jansen's son.